as we continue to learn new types of counting tricks, the next thing we're going to discuss are called bell numbers. Sterling numbers of the second kind counted the number of ways to partition a set of n elements into k non-empty subsets. Bell numbers simply count the number of ways to partition n elements into any quantity of non-empty subsets. So we're going to denote these as b sub n. So b sub n is the number of ways to partition n elements regardless of how many subsets you use. But what we see is that the bell number of n elements is just the sum of all the Stirling numbers of the second kind. Because if you wish to partition n elements into some quantity of non-empty sets, you could partition them into one set or two sets or three sets all the way up to n sets. And for each choice of how many subsets you're going to use, the Stirling number tells you how many ways you can create those partitions. So if you add up the number of ways to partition n elements into i non-empty subsets, where i takes all possible values between just one set, so you'd have the entire set you began with, all the way up to n sets, so every element gets its own set, if you add up all of those quantities, you'll have all possible ways to partition n elements, regardless of how many pieces you want to put them into. So for example, the bell number b sub 3, which counts the number of ways to partition three elements into any number of subsets, can be written as the number of ways to partition three elements into one subset, or the number of ways to partition three elements into two subsets, or the number of ways to partition three elements into three subsets. If we were only using one subset, we would have to use the entire set. If we wish to use two subsets, well then, two elements will go in one set and one in the other, and there are three distinct ways to do that. And if we wish to use three different subsets, well then, each element gets its own subset. So let's take a look at a bin sorting problem. We have n labeled balls and k labeled bins with absolutely no restrictions as to how many balls go into a single bin. How many ways can we do this? For example, if you have four balls and 12 bins, the balls are labeled one through four, the bins are labeled one through 12, and you just sort of start throwing them around, how many ways could you possibly end up? It's actually quite straightforward to analyze this problem. So what we're going to do is we have n labeled balls and we'll simply consider each of them as a task. Each task now has k possible choices because each ball has k bins that it can go into. And there are n distinct balls that we need to distribute. There are no restrictions on leaving bins empty or not putting more than one ball into a bin. So what you do with one of your tasks has no bearing on what happens with the others. So for each ball, we have k distinct choices and there are n total balls and since none of the tasks really interacts with the others we just multiply all the various possibilities for a total result of k to the n. So if you just have a complete labeling, labeled balls and labeled bins, and no restrictions on how to distribute things, it's really just an exponential counting. So here's a slightly subtler bin sorting problem. Now we have n labeled balls and k unlabeled bins, but we have no restrictions as to how many balls can go into each bin. How many ways can we perform this distribution? Now, if the bins had to be non-empty, these would simply be Stirling numbers of the second kind. Remember, the Stirling number of the second kind, n over k, counts how many ways to partition n elements into k non-empty subsets. And as a bin sorting problem, this was labeled balls into unlabeled bins with no bin left empty. But what we're going to do to attack this problem is first ask how many bins are left non-empty. If there are i non-empty bins, now we're partitioning n balls into i non-empty subsets, and that's counted with Stirling numbers of the second kind. Different choices, however, of how many non-empty subsets we uh, are going to use or how many non-empty bins we're going to use, produce different solutions. Using three bins versus five is a very different thing. So we're simply going to sum up over all possible choices of i. Now i is how many bins are not empty. And that can range from one to k. Maybe one bin is non-empty, or maybe all k bins are non-empty. Now if k was allowed to be sufficiently large, for example, if it went to n or larger, 
So if the number of bins is at least as large as the number of balls, here we would just get bell numbers. Remember the sum as i goes from 1 to n of these sterling numbers of the second kind would give me the nth bell number. But it's possible we have, for example, 10 labeled balls, but only seven unlabeled bins, in which case we're not going to count all possible partitions. We'd only be counting them up to the ones using seven different subsets. So this is a little bit different than a bell number, and it's a little bit different than a sterling number of the second kind, but it's something in between. Now let's talk about something called partition numbers. So sterling and bell numbers rely on the fact that the balls are, are distinguishable. In other words, they're elements of the set and we can tell them apart, but the bins are not. Two different sets with the same elements are considered the same set. So the elements of the set are like our balls, they are distinguishable, but the sets are like our bins and we only care what goes into them. The set itself does not have a label on it. But what if the balls are also not labeled? Now we have unlabeled objects going into unlabeled bins. How many ways can I take un n unlabeled balls and put them into non-empty bins? As before, we're gonna disregard empty bins because we couldn't add any number of them. So how many ways can I put n unlabeled balls into non-empty bins is actually the same question as saying, how many ways can we represent n as the sum of positive integers? Because it does not matter which balls go into which bins, all I'm really counting is how many balls are there in how many different bins. Three balls in one bin and two in another is the same as two balls in the first and three in the second because the bins can't be distinguished and neither can the balls. So what we're doing is we're taking our n total objects and splitting them up into non-empty collections. So if we sum up the size of those collections, we should reconstitute all n balls. So for example, how many ways can we partition five objects into non-empty subsets? We count the number of different ways based on how many balls go into non-empty bins. And in order to keep different distributions separate, we're always going to list the bins from that which has the most balls in it to that which has the least. This just helps us keep it straight. So we can take our five balls as a bin containing five balls, a bin containing four and a bin containing one, a bin containing three and a bin containing two, a bin containing three and a bin containing one and a bin containing one, a bin containing two and then two and then one, two and then one and then one and then one, or maybe all five balls go into their own individual bin. So here we see what was meant earlier by saying partitioning unlabeled balls into unlabeled bins is equivalent to asking how can we take the number of balls and write it as a sum of different positive integers. So the number five can be written as five, four plus one, three plus two, three plus one plus one, etc. And we're listing these from largest integer to smallest just so that as we tried to come up with the different ways of writing the number five, if you came up with, for example, one plus three plus one, as soon as you order that from biggest to smallest, you'd say, ah, it's the same as this one right here. The number of ways to put n unlabeled balls into any quantity of unlabeled bins, equivalently, the number of ways to write the positive integer n as a sum of positive integers is called a partition number, p of n. So above, what we've computed is that p of 5 is 7. There were exactly seven ways to write the number 5 as a sum of different positive integers. Let's see if we can come up with a formula for computing these partition numbers. So we're going to develop an explicit formula for uh, computing them. I'm just kidding, of course. Actually, no such formula is known. There is no explicit formula to just say, okay, now let's compute p of 12 or p of 238, but we will manually compute several of these. Okay, so for a total of one, we want to express the number one as a sum of positive integers. The only way to do that is with the number one itself. In terms of balls into bins, if I have a single ball, I put it into a bin and I'm done, and there's only one way to do that. So p of 1 is 1. What if I have 2? Well, we could put two balls into a single bin, or we could put one ball into two separate bins. And there are therefore 
two separate ways to do it, so p of 2 is equal to 2. For three balls into bins, we could put all three into a single bin. We could put two into one bin and one into another, or we can put one ball into three distinct bins, so p of 3 is equal to 3. Now, so far, it definitely looks like there's some sort of pattern. p of 1 is 1, p of 2 is 2, p of 3 is 3. But we have seen that p of 5 was 7, so it, it does not continue in this very simple way. So for four balls, we could do all four balls into one bin. We could do 3 and 1 and 1 and 1. We could do 2 and 2, or we can do 2 and 1 and 1. Or we could do our, all four balls into their own bins. So there were five ways to do this. So p of 4 is actually equal to 5. We've already computed p of 5 is equal to 7. It appears they're starting to get bigger. Let's try to compute p of 8. OK, we're going to jump right to p of 8 really as an exercise to show that it begins to become quite difficult to compute these explicitly. So we could put 8 all by itself. We could do 7 plus 1. If the largest element is 7, if the bin with the most balls has 7 balls, there's only one left over, so there's not much to do with it. However, if the largest number of balls in a bin is 6, I have 2 left over. Now, with 2 balls left over, I could do a 2 by itself or a 1 and a 1. So if the largest bin has 6 balls in it, there are two ways to complete that problem. Now, if the largest bin has five elements, I have three more to distribute. There are several possibilities. That remaining three balls goes into their own bin. I can do a two and a one, or I can do a one and a one and a one. Notice that these solutions here correspond to how we computed the partition number P of three. What if there are four balls in the bin with the most balls? Then there's four left over, meaning I can do a four, or I can do a 3 and a 1, or I can do 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, or all four in their own thing. So just by manually can't counting them out, okay, if the largest element is 4, then I have four elements remaining, and we've computed the fourth partition number according to 4, 3 and 1, 2 and 2, and so forth. So it almost seems to be a pretty straightforward recursive relationship that somehow you sum over what the largest set is and then you just have to distribute the rest according to a smaller number of balls which is a partition number that we may have already computed but it doesn't quite work like that see if we have eight balls total and the largest amount in a single bin is three there are five balls left over but since we've declared no bin has more than three balls. The remaining five balls cannot just be distributed according to how we did the fifth partition number. Because in describing the fifth partition number, we did things like put all five into their own set or do four and one. But these wouldn't be allowed because we declared nothing larger than three is going to be used. So in fact, if the largest number is three, here is an exhaustive list of what you can do. Since the largest number is 3, maybe I do 3 and 3, in which case there's 2 left over. So 3, 3, 2, or 3, 3, 1, 1. Or maybe the second largest number is 2, in which case I have 3 left over, but I can't do 3, 2, 3, because that would have already been covered here. So if I first have 3 and then I have 2, and I have 3 elements left to distribute, but I'm only allowed to use 2 or smaller, I can do 3, 2, 2, 1, or 3, 2, 1, 1, 1. And then possibly if the largest number was 3 and the second largest number is 1, well, if the second largest number is 1, everything after it has to be a 1. So what begins to happen is that generating partition numbers isn't quite as straightforward as the first few examples seemed. So there has actually been progress in the study of partition numbers and their properties in the last 10, 10 to 15 years. Uh, it's been a fairly active re um, subject of study, but still, at least to my knowledge, when these videos were recorded, there is no nice explicit formula to just compute them and be done with it. There are, however, something called the restricted partition numbers. So a restricted partition number counts the number of ways to write the number n as a sum of exactly k positive integers. They're denoted with subscripts, so p of 8 would have been how many ways to write 8 as a sum of positive integers, p sub 3 of 8 
says, how many ways can I write 8 as a sum of exactly three positive integers? So I can't just write it as 8 or 7 plus 1 because I'm required to use three numbers. But I could do 611, 521, 431, 422, 332. But that's it. If I have to use exactly three numbers, what you can do is you can express that the biggest number cannot be seven or larger, because then I would only have one or zero left and I need two more numbers to write. So the biggest number is at most six, but the smallest number has to be at least three. If the, if the I'm sorry, if the biggest number has to be at least three. If the biggest number was two, then I could only do, for example, two, 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 and that would need four numbers. So the biggest number has to be between three and six. And then you can start working from there. So the restricted partition number p sub three of eight is five. There are five ways to write the number eight as a sum of exactly three different numbers. So we claim the following. The partition number without restrictions can be written as a sum as i goes from one to n of the restricted partition numbers. All we're really claiming here is that on the left, we're counting all the way to write the number n as a sum of positive integers. On the right, we're saying, first, how can I write n as the sum of one positive integer? And then how can I write n as the sum of two positive integers? All the way up to how can I write n as a sum of n positive integers? One and n represent the most extreme cases. If I want to write n as one integer, I simply write it as n. If I want to write n as the sum of n positive integers, I do 1 plus 1 plus 1, etc. And summing up over everything in between will account for all possible ways to write the nth partition number. But as I mentioned, there's no explicit formula for computing the partition numbers, so there isn't an explicit formula for computing these either. Since there is this relationship between partition numbers and restricted partition numbers, if I had an explicit formula for one, I could quickly derive a formula for the other. There isn't one, at least not as of right now. 